Thanks, Nicole. Thanks for the fun trivia to get us back in Wade mode after lunch. Um, we have really exciting presentations for you guys today. We're gonna learn about how a couple of our conservation districts across the state adapted their educational programming to a virtual setting over the last year and change with COVID. Um, so we're first gonna hear about um, Pierce Conservation District's uh, youth education program. We're gonna hear from Chris Tao and Leika Hansen. Um, and just to give you uh, some background on our presenters, Chris is the Environmental Education Manager at Pierce Conservation District, and he's been with PCD since 2010. He primarily works with volunteers on restoration plantings and then providing environmental education to students throughout Pierce County. Um, and he actively participates in local networks that focus on environmental education and outreach. And one of his favorite parts about his job is seeing how excited kids get when they explore their environment and see new interesting things. We're also going to hear from Leika. Um, she's the PCD AmeriCorps, edu AmeriCorps member supporting the environmental education program. And she's originally from Michigan and graduated from Brigham Young University in Utah with a bachelor's in environmental science before moving to Western Washington. Um, she loves being outside and talking about the beautiful world we live in. And in her downtime, she enjoys swimming, biking, hiking, taking photos and sewing. So we're going to start with a presentation from them, have some time for Q&A, and then we'll move on to our second presentation um, from Kara at Franklin Conservation District, and she's the education director there. Um, she's been employed there for the past 16 years, and she graduated with a bachelor's degree from WSU and a master's in education administration from Heritage University. Um, she's taught as an adjunct professor for Heritage University and is a graduate of the Ag Forestry Leadership Program and sits on the board of directors for ESD 123. And Kara lives in Pasco with her husband, Patrick, and their three adult children. So we'll look forward to hearing those two presentations. There'll be time for questions after the end. So feel free as you have questions, type them into the chat um, and Nicole will be able to read those to each presenter. So with that, we'll turn it over to Chris and Leika to hear about how they adapted their education program. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for having us. I'm Chris. Lake is here also from Pierce Conservation District. Thanks for that introduction, Nikki. And uh, we're happy to share a little bit about our experience during this past year delivering our education programs. And today we're going to focus um, on a specific program that we uh, offered here in Tacoma Public Schools uh, in a partnership with the school district, some community partners, and a curriculum author that we learned a lot over the past few months. So that's what we'll be touching on here in this presentation. So our mission uh, with this program, um, in, in addition to the work of all the other virtual programming that we've done over the past year, which we've learned a lot from, was to focus on reaching every single fifth grade class in Tacoma Public Schools. So 35 fifth grade schools um, were adopting this, this curriculum pilot uh, from Explore the Salish Sea. And these fifth grade classes were to be split among about four community partners of, what, of which we were one. And so each community partner was tasked with supporting their schools through the unit um, and uh, specializing in a certain data collection parameter that we'll touch on in a little bit. But basically, we were adopting a bunch of schools to usher them through this unit that we were trying out for the first time uh, from the CDOC Society, which wrote this curriculum um, with the Salmon Migration Unit being the first one that these schools were trying. So we were helping them get through this unit and uh, learn during this virtual uh, learning period. To help them, uh, we were set up to offer synchronous or live uh, class visits remotely with them and visiting with the students uh, in real time, but also offering asynchronous learning activities that they could work on from home or during their other cohort day because every school and every class is uh, working their way through the scheduling during uh, this, this, this period. And so we were trying to be flexible in offering some live visits when we could, but also 
um, understanding that some classes were going to have to operate on their own schedule and to provide those resources for them as well. And then after we delivered these, um, we were to present them with real world data on Swan Creek. So we couldn't take them out to Swan Creek for a field trip like we normally would. And so our task was to collect the data and present it to them so that way they could analyze it and interpret it themselves. And with that data, choose a salmon release site on Swan Creek. So one of the partners, Foss Waterway Seaport, had been raising salmon and were to be released in Swan Creek. And we wanted the students to make the best choice possible for where those were to be released. And Swan Creek is of interest because um, it's home to a coho salmon run and they're experiencing some pre-spawn mortality uh, since it's an urban stream. It's been an issue that's been a focus lately. And so the students were learning about how those pollution issues were affecting salmon and where we might find a good habitat site where the salmon could be released to have the best chance in order to survive. And then the organizers also wanted the students to walk away with something that they could implement that would improve the situation. So after learning about watershed issues and salmon survival, um, to be able to do something with that. And so for us, normally we would love to go do restoration plantings with them and it just wasn't doable. And so we came up with another solution that would work for the students we were partnering with for them to do um, at their home. Yeah, so like Chris said, we started off our program with some synchronous lessons. We joined a lot of these students live throughout their school day and we brought a game called Salmon Survivors to them where they learned about the salmon life cycle and all the obstacles that salmon face um, in this game of chance. And so we played that with them and we offered some other videos and supplemental activities for them to work on um, when we weren't in the classroom along with um, the Sea Doc Society's migration unit. There was a lot of like artwork and science components that you could do with the students. And our other synchronous lesson that we had, um, we had all of our data that we had collected over the past couple of months on Swan Creek. And we were looking for a way to condense that and make that easily available for the students to look through. They're not looking through like huge Excel spreadsheets of just numbers. We want to make it really fun and engaging for them really get to see the site even if they're not going to be able to go in person. And so luckily we had someone here at the district that was pretty handy with ArcGIS and we figured we were inspired by Thurston's um, story map where they had their water quality um, educational program. And so we put together our own story map and filled it in with all the data from the community partners and delivered that to the students. And so I've got a quick little run through we have our three sites and so we started with an overview from Mira from the Sea Doc Society where she talked about the issues the salmon were facing what we were going to do. We had our map of the sites and we had some drone footage that I took for each of the sites as well. The students could really see bird's eye view. And then we had our vegetation survey that um, Tacoma Nature Center put together, put some videos together and then Foss Water Seaport had their water quality testing that they went out to the sites, took some video and brought it all back for us. Then the students were able to look at water quality standards and if and see how each site was doing in comparison. And then for our part, we had our stream complexity, which is just wetted width, depth, flow, and all these things that affect salmon habitat, like substrate as well. So we had some videos, some pictures, and our measurements that they could look through. And then lastly, we had our biological survey of macroinvertebrates which are just the little bugs that salmon eat as they're growing up and going to the ocean. Um, and so we took video and pictures as best we could to try and show what was living in the stream and what food was available for the, the baby coho we're going to put there. And so we were able to put all of our data together, give that to the students, and we walked through um, with them in our synchronous lesson and tried to yeah, and they were able to ask questions about what we learned and what we were trying to show and then help interpret the data, the data together. Yeah, basically we were trying to bring a field trip to all these classes um, and all these students without actually having them out there and present them the data in a meaningful way um, without us alongside them, which you know was definitely 
a challenge, but the organizers really wanted the students to kind of own that data and then make an informed choice on where these salmon should be released. And so each partner um, was kind of tasked with giving their own coaching and their own data collection to the students based on you know their expertise and um, what parameter they were assigned. So for us, like Laika mentioned, we presented stream complexity and macroinvertebrates. And so after some coaching with the story map and some visits, we posed the question to all, all the students, based on the data, as you understand it, which site should these salmon be released at? And uh, it was kind of split between a couple sites for our parameters. Um, but when the, the whole picture was taken into account, um, especially with habitat, um, because the riparian zone was, was very different based on the sites, the canopy um, was very different for the different sites. Uh, site one ended up being the clear choice. You know, which we were hoping. We knew site one was where we wanted the salmon to be released, but we were hoping the students would interpret the data that way, and they did. And once we got those votes in, uh, we partnered with Foss Waterway Seaport for a live broadcast of the salmon uh, release. And so the students could tune in and see the fry being put into the creek, uh, see the project overall, see what the other classes had worked on, uh, and then see kind of the fruits of their their labor and their learning. So it was really fun to broadcast um, the salmon release. And we were able to show a couple of classes after the fact of what had happened to the salmon. And that was really valuable um, to kind of show them the, the culmination of what they learned. Yeah, so after all of the fish were happily in their new home, we, um, we kind of ran, uh, circled back to some of the things that we learned in our lessons and so the students had learned that stormwater pollution is a huge influence on these salmon and so we wanted to give them a hands-on project that they could do to help um, and so the native flowers that we gave them in this packet they got some lupin and they got a bag of soil and they know that planting native flowers and native shrubs will help filter water before it enters places like Swan Creek and so they were able to do that little action project in addition to all the other learning that they did. So there are definitely quite a few lessons learned during this uh, crash course um, of supporting this remote learning for you know a whole grade uh, within T Tacoma Public Schools. And the fact that we were able to reach a whole grade at all um, was something of a silver lining the remote programming, the nature of it, allowed us to reach more students. In our case, 270 students, um, which is about half of what we had committed to, but about half the classes just weren't able to kind of take us up on our offer um, and make it work with their schedule, which is you know, one of the realities of this year, this school year, is that some teachers just weren't able to plug into some of the resources that were available. So we would have loved to reach more, um, but the fact that we reached 270 was definitely a positive. Um, of course, it doesn't replace, you know, in-person field trips and hands-on learning, but um, there is some benefit to being being able to reach more students with this kind of environmental education. So we're happy to make that happen for sure. And the material that we produced um, for this program and others isn't going to be, you know, put put on the shelf necessarily when we move forward and are able to do more. We plan to use some of the videos and the platforms and the, even the asynchronous activities to support some of our future work. This program in particular, we have really high hopes for um, in reaching every fifth grade class, but with in-person work and getting them out into the field. And so being able to use some of the things that we created is gonna help um, leverage that work and make sure that we can reach more students, customize some of the things that we're working on with different schools and districts. And so some of this material is going to be really valuable um, going forward. Yeah, and it was definitely valuable this year. Um, a lot of the students and teachers gave some feedback that they liked voting on the release site and having that direct impact based on what they learned. Um, and that they were happy to see them in the salmon release on that Saturday as well. 
And then we were thinking that, of course, we'll have our project continue over the next couple of years. Um, but even just things like story maps and digital media, um, these are things that can apply to any other educational projects as well. Like you can always scale things like this up or down. Um, you can kind of cut it into pieces using things like Nearpod and Flipgrid so you can get more student feedback. Um, or you could even make data into a blog post. You can add videos and photos. Um, and so we really see this as a great way to disseminate and share data that we collect and get students involved and become community scientists. And we have one review from uh, a teacher at Mann Elementary that said, my students love the experience and learn so much and that they were overjoyed at the release on Saturday and can't wait for their students to get the reaction to it. And so that was right after we finished the lessons with them. But overall, we got some good feedback and it was fun to see all the students even in the virtual world and we're happy to we're happy to see this continue and maybe mesh it all together. And so with that, I think we'll, I don't know if we're taking questions now or later, but thanks for joining us. Thanks, Chris and Leica. Yeah, I think we will um, take questions now. So Nicole, I'm not sure if you see any in the chat, otherwise I can start us off. Yep, we've got one here. Um, uh, Helen's asking, how did the four partners develop the curriculum without being able to meet in person? It must have been pretty complicated. Yeah, um, so it was a curriculum written by the Sea Doc Society, um, the Explorer of the Salish Sea, um, and they have a book that goes along with it. And so we were invited you know, to some early conversations um, about implementing this in Tacoma Public Schools. And so the curriculum itself was there and really the conversation was you know how can partners support this learning and so for us in particular there may have been a salmon life cycle lesson um, or you know an art project that was part of the curriculum and we were able to kind of uh, share our own flavor of that and kind of use the way we teach and, and meld it a little bit so the curriculum itself was was put together already and it was about finding the community partners role um, in making it happen. So it was, yeah, it was a fun, it was fun to see how the different partners kind of use their own expertise and staff to um, kind of make the curriculum work for the schools that they were partnered with. Great, that's the chat we, or the question we have so far in chat. Just remind folks you can put questions into that questions box. Otherwise, Nikki, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks. Yeah, I was curious about funding for the program. How did that work and um, plans moving forward? Yeah, um, the CDOC Society received um, some grants, including from the um, Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi Foundation, and so that supported um, the, the books to the classes and um, able to get some pass-through funding to support some staff time and materials for those seed packets since we handed out 270 native wildflower seed packets, so that kind of funding helped um, with that, and we're hoping to, you know, build this up into Bus field buses for field trips and scientific testing for for the stream to do in person. So that'll be something that we'll definitely have to kind of tackle as we look to move this from fully remote to hybrid to hopefully eventually all in person. Is that the plan? Are you guys thinking for next year, making that transition or? The plan right now, the initial plan is to do this in person or at least hybrid with 10 schools, which will also include um, 10 salmon tanks. So each school would have a salmon tank where they would raise their own salmon and then come to the release um, on places like Swan Creek in the future. So our first, first milestone will be to get 10 schools under our belts and then eventually work our way up to all 35 um, fifth grade schools in Tacoma Public Schools by the end. Great. Were there any other questions coming through the chat, Nicole? Not at this time. All right. Well, thank you, Chris and Leica. And if you guys um, 
we'll have Kara's presentation and then we'll do a Q&A at the very end as well. All right. Thanks, Kara. Thanks for joining us. Hi. So Nikki, you're gonna show your screen, right? With my presentation, yeah. perfect. You guys can hear me okay? Sounds great. Yeah, take it away. Awesome. Well, first of all, thank you, Nikki, for the invitation to talk about the education programs that we do from the Franklin Conservation District. Um, I'm excited to kind of share some of the, the things that we've been able to do uh, over the past year. Um, so again, my name is Kara Calver. I'm the Education Director at the Franklin Conservation District. Been there for several years, and I just want to take you through the education programs that we uh, that I currently coordinate and what we did during COVID this last school year, and then um, some lessons learned from, from that experience. So next slide, Nikki. I first have to give a huge shout out to my educators. Um, without them, none of this would have been possible. So I just, uh, a couple of them are on uh, the webinar today and uh but i the people that are on the screen megan michaela kirk liz brent and kylie are really the reason why we were able to proceed during a COVID year because i had several uh, moments where i thought you know why don't we just skip this year and just take a, a hybrid year with ourselves and do something different or do something uh um else and and then come back when everything returns to normal because i just wasn't sure how we were gonna wrap our heads around moving everything online or or into the virtual setting so with the help of these brilliant um, educators we were able to do some phenomenal things so i just have to give them a huge shout out because they've been amazing next slide nikki so the four education programs that i coordinate out of the franklin conservation district um, is a program called We Week uh, that's been around since 2007. So this next year, we're gonna be celebrating our 15th year in classrooms. The next one is Drain Rangers, um, and I'll explain each one of these a little bit more in depth um, in a minute. Uh, we also have Junior Drain Rangers, and then we have our Salmon in the Classroom program. Go ahead, Nikki. So what does We Week, well, let's start with We Week. Uh, Wheat Week was traditionally in the classroom, five days a week uh, program that we taught to fourth and fifth graders, one hour. It's a program that teaches students about natural resources and conservation and scientific concepts using wheat as the teaching tool. It's a series of five one hour lessons taught over the course of the week and each classroom gets a one hour lesson. And, and then each, each of those lessons is taught by one of my regional educators. So it's pretty time consuming as far as my educators time throughout the school year. So what did virtual week week look like? Well, it was a lot different. And thanks to some online training that we all took part in, um, given by the ESDs, actually the Associate, Association of ESDs last spring, it was called Reimagine Washington. Yeah. Thanks, Nikki. <laughs> um, we were able to take some professional development from Jeff Utech, who was a professional at teaching kids online. He'd been doing it for several years. So he kind of trained a lot of teachers within Washington State very quickly on how to adapt to online learning. And some of the things he recommended were was to create short, small video content. It, well, in little little chunks. You know, you we didn't want to take our one hour lessons and totally convert those just to a one hour online lesson that wasn't gonna be successful according to his recommendations. So what we did is we created eight five minute videos, about five minutes, and we also created a at home um, kit that the kids each received so they could still grow the wheat in their terrariums, which is part of Wheat Week, at home. And um, together with my, with my educators, we brainstormed what exactly was gonna be the most important takeaways for students. So if you can imagine taking an hour long presentation and you know con condensing it down into five minutes, you've really gotta cut out a lot and you have, really have to rethink what your priorities are and what was important for us to teach. And so um, thanks to my educators, we, we were able to do that and, and I think do it quite successfully. So. 
we condensed 300 minutes down to about 40. And we still made sure that kids were able to thresh a wheat head and plant wheat in a terrarium at home, as well as do a couple other uh, uh, things. Okay, Nikki, go ahead. So to give you a sense of these kits that we sent home, each student got to take what was uh, included on the right side of the screen in that picture that you see. And uh, there's a picture of my educator, Liz, carrying bags of kits into a school. I think this was in Toppenish. And she's loaded down. I think she's got 10 bags of 10 kits in each bag on each hand. <laughs> so she's, she's got a lot of kits there that she's she's carrying in. So that was some of the feedback we got from teachers was probably related to these kits primarily was that the hands-on portion was very, very much appreciated, very necessary. It's what made a difference between any other program going virtually and, and, and our program. Um, they, they said it was really important that these kids got to experience those hands-on components. And that was a lot that was taken away from them because of virtual learning. So next slide, Nikki. So Drain Rangers is a stormwater runoff pollution prevention program that's been around for several years. Um, about five or six years ago, the Pacific Education Institute asked me to redesign the curriculum uh, to make it relevant to Eastern Washington because the Drain Ranger curriculum that, that existed before that was created um, and had a Western Washington focus. And so the Drain Rangers that we teach in Eastern Washington just has a little bit different um, focus on water uh, quality versus water quantity. Uh, so it's it, it, we tweaked a little a little bit of it, but for the most part, it's the same as the Drain Ranger program you'll find in Western Washington. So it's geared towards third and fifth grade. It's a teacher uh, curriculum that I train teachers through a teacher workshop to deliver within their classrooms. However, there were components of Drain Rangers that teachers were able to sign up through the conservation districts and have our educators come out into the classrooms and teach those specific lessons that are in the Drain Ranger curriculum. Um, so we cover, with Drain Rangers, we cover um, Kittitas and Yakima counties, as well as Benton and Franklin counties. And their Drain Ranger program is also, Jody Prout does that over at the Palouse Conservation District down in Asotan County and Whitman County as well. It's been a very popular program. So um, virtually, how did we modify this? Well, it was taking the teacher workshop that I normally do in person and making it virtual. So it was still a three, three through five grade curriculum that I would train teachers on. Um, we, instead of going out and being able to teach those certain lessons that were in the curriculum to students, we allowed teachers to check out our kits so that they could still use those, those components to teach their students and make it easy on them. They didn't have to find all those materials and things like that. And then also we created a couple video demonstrations that I would normally have them do in a teacher workshop live. I would demonstrate it, they would do it. So we just created videos to kind of give them the sense of how, how that was implemented um, in their classroom. Next slide, Nikki. So Junior Drain Rangers is a program that we have for grades K through two. Also stormwater runoff pollution prevention. Uh, and how to protect our local waterways. So these were, we had three lessons, K1 and 2, each had a one one hour lesson per grade. So students during those lessons would understand what a storm drain was, what runoff, stormwater runoff pollution meant, you know, what pollution was, and then they would create a little water drop magnet that they would put on their refrigerator with some water conservation tips that they could take home. Uh, very popular program for our, our teachers to invite my educators into their classroom once again to do those lessons. So virtually, uh, this program was probably our hardest to transition because K1 and 2, making that interactive is, is a lot, for us it was a lot harder. So my brilliant educator, Kylie, um, she um, was in the process of doing her student teaching at the time and was using a lot of Google Classroom materials. So she created some Google slide lessons um, to replicate our lessons that we would do in the classroom. So students could do them online, either with their teacher or well, independently, and their teacher could, could look through those slides and see how their student had progressed. But one of the big things that we did is we created an activity or a coloring book and Nikki, go ahead and scroll through that coloring book because my educator, Liz, out of Ellensburg, 
drew this. She literally created it from scratch. Um, our junior drain ranger coloring and activity book and I had them printed so that each student would get one of these and it was a way for us to send something home it was a little more hands on I mean it's not an activity. But it's a coloring book and, and an activity book that they can do by themselves or with their parents, so we were drawing in the general public as far as their parents were concerned, we were. Um, incorporating a QR code that would take them to our website so that they could do the activities at home in case they weren't doing them with their teacher or with their parent or yeah with their teacher in the classroom they could do it with their parents so we were trying to you know every way we could to reach these students that normally we are teaching them face to face in the classroom so like i said this one was a little bit more difficult for us to uh, adapt uh, but I'll, I'll share with you some of the lessons we learned from it so our last program that i want to talk about is salmon in the classroom and traditionally i have 21 tanks in franklin and walla walla counties uh, those tanks are primarily at fourth grade. I know the entire Pasco school district has adopted Salmon in the Classroom as a fourth grade curriculum. So at least in Pasco, all of the fourth graders participate. And then um, I have a few tanks at high schools and uh, one at a middle school. And normally, in a normal year, the month of May is spent releasing salmon at our salmon events. So the students get their eggs in January. They raise them in their classroom until um, May. And then the, the School decides when they're going to come release them. I, I met the park literally the entire month of May because I allow each of my schools to come independently as just that school that day and they get the whole day to spend at the park releasing their fish and rotating through stations and learning all about um, how science and history and geography kind of meet because we, we do our salmon releases at Sacagawea Park in Pasco. Um, really important stop for Lewis and Clark and it's part of fourth grade. Um, study of Washington State history and and all these kinds of great tie-ins. So virtually um, th this program we kn I knew right away that I wasn't going to allow students or to raise salmon in their classrooms and I, I wasn't going to allow fish to be in schools because I didn't know at any given time they could have shut down schools and then what, what are we going to do with these fish are we going to have to release them like we did last year what if they're not in a stage where you can release them the other question or concern I had was about um, um sanitizing schools in in order to pr protect the students a lot of our schools in the hybrid were going to school monday tuesday taking wednesday off and going to school thursday friday and they would use wednesday as a day to sanitize the school and some of those schools were using fog machines and things like that that were spraying chemicals into the air and so i was worried that maybe the fish wouldn't be in a in the best environment so I said no no fish in schools this year. We decided to do it virtually by putting a web camera on the tank that I have in my office. And we created some of the lessons as well for students to do at home. Like we read some salmon books and shared those with our teacher. I offered my teachers a salmon life cycle, a bracelet uh, activity that I would just drop off to them if they wanted to do that with their students. And then, um, uh, we didn't obviously have a salmon release, uh, so it, it felt a lot different as far as virtual, but the trade-off, hang on just a second, I'm sorry, I'm getting to my, my notes. Um, the trade-off was actually more than I expected, um, and, I'll, and I'll share those, those with you in just a minute. So we live streamed each day, um, and I send it out on our Facebook, our Franklin CD web Facebook page. I send it out to everybody I knew to kind of say like, anybody can participate in Salmon in the Classroom this year because it's virtual. Like all you have to do is be able to get onto YouTube, which I didn't think was gonna be a big deal, except for my own school district, the Pasco School District uh, blocked YouTube for grades K through five. So my students actually in Pasco were not able to, to get on and I would I had to do a lot of workarounds to get them to be able to, but that was that was pretty much the biggest hang up that we had otherwise anybody that could get on youtube could get on and look at our salmon and watch them every day okay nikki go ahead so the lessons learned boy there were a lot i tried to condense them down during week week uh the biggest takeaway that i've learned this year is that you cannot replace face to face just like what chris was saying it, it, there's no substitute for face to face whether you're having a meeting a conference or you're teaching in the classroom but you know, we all have to make do and we learned some some great things from from having to, being forced to not do face to face. Less is sometimes more. So I did have teachers actually uh, comment on our evaluations for week week that the five minute videos weren't enough. 
and they wanted a full hour long. They wanted our whole lesson recorded, basically. And uh, to me, that wasn't serving this purpose. I didn't feel like it was uh, the students would actually be utilizing it in, in the way that they needed to be. So in my opinion, less was more for us uh, when you're working in a virtual setting and dealing with small children. And then the hands-on component cannot be left out. I think that was really important lesson that we learned. Teachers were very, very appreciative. And, and that was what my educators spent this year doing, making kits, delivering kits. Um, that, that's what kept them employed. And, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, and I was also shipping kits. I shipped kits to new places. So the silver lining for our virtual Wee Week is that we reached new audiences. We reached schools, students, and teachers that we've never been able to teach at before because of location. I have a, a lot of educators, but they can't teach everywhere. So this was, we were able to reach new audiences and that was just wonderful. Okay, Nikki, go ahead. And let me just say this about Wee Week. I, I apologize, I jumped ahead of myself. Um, we will be continuing to offer virtual Wee Week moving ahead. So I don't want, I didn't want to offer it to a school district this year virtually and say, oh yeah, sorry, we're going back into the classroom and we're not going to do it anymore. So those schools that we brought on board that are only going to be able to have it virtually, they're always going to be able to have it virtually. Um, my educators are going to be doing both next year. They're going to be doing virtual and in-person Wee Week. Granted, I'm hoping we can get back into schools, which I'm pretty sure we will. So virtual drain rangers, um, the lessons I learned from this one uh, was simply that, <laughs> once again, nothing replaces face-to-face, -face. that's the common theme, but Zoom workshops, in particular teacher workshops, because that's what I do uh, mostly, they just, two hours is the most, it, it really is. And I even like to think that be, breaking that up into one hours at a time is even better because I've tried longer and it's just, it's hard, it's really hard. And I've been a, a part of lots and lots of professional development this year, lots and lots of these trainings. And I've seen some of them try to take an eight hour workshop you do in person and do eight hours online. And that's, you know, that's death by training, that's hard. So the other takeaway I have is about breakout rooms. You know, I've tried them, I've been part of them, I just don't know where I sit with them. They're kind of eh, in my opinion. One of my educators was on a uh, webinar last week and she said she was given the choice to go into the breakout room or not. And guess what? Nobody went. Like when you're given that choice, you're like, phew, I don't have to go. I don't want to go. <laughs> so that was maybe one of uh, the areas that we struggle with in creating these uh, virtual workshops is, you know, breakout rooms get you together and get you to collaborate, but sometimes, we're just not in that mindset to do that. So it's really a toss up. Teachers were definitely suffering from Zoom fatigue as we all probably are. However, the silver lining is that they are so flexible. You know, I can offer a teacher workshop to anybody, you know, that wants to hop on. It's super easy. There's not a lot of prep. I don't have to reserve a room. There's no travel. I don't have to feed them. I don't have to worry about, oh, schlepping my materials, you know, across town or even across the state or whatever. So there's just a lot of, a lot of silver linings that we can take from, from this COVID year. All right, Nikki, last one. Oh, second to last. We got junior drain rangers. Um, I can't wait to get back in the classroom with this one. Uh, the only part of this, I think that we're going to continue to offer virtually is um, we're still going to have the opportunity for students to participate online if they find this find us online if they're homeschool if they're um, in the virtual um, education mode next year because every district is offering a virtual component that's still going to be available but i just know our teachers are going to want us back in the classroom right away it's going to be a lot easier um, for us to do and um the other silver lining was the activity book that we created. That's not going to go away. That's that for us has just been uh, really fun to put that into kids' hands because they enjoy it. Teachers enjoy it. Parents enjoy it. We're going to be using that at our local fair. We're going to be using that at our home and garden show. So it's meeting all of our stormwater needs for our cities and counties that are, are, are paying for stormwater education. So that has been a real bonus for us as well. And then finally, salmon in the classroom. My last slide for you, the lessons I've learned, is that um, you can't replace the in-person experience of raising fish. 
um, it was okay, really, it was actually quite good for the students to watch it online. It, they learned a lot and, and pretty much as they normally would. However, what I feel like they missed was that personal connection. Because when you raise an animal that close to you and you interact with it on a daily basis, and then when you put that animal into the river and you say goodbye to it, that personal connection was lost. So for me, Salmon in the Classroom has always been the most powerful science um, program that we've experienced in schools because of that heart piece, because of that personal connection those salmon have to that student that raised them. When they put it into the river, they get an automatic connection to the river, the river system, making sure that it stays clean for their salmon. They wanna protect it. They wanna be good stewards of our land and our water. So it's really, I feel like that, that piece was missing. However, some of the benefits to the virtual, and I know moving forward, I plan on doing virtual side-by-side -side with the in-class in uh, program as well, because what you can do when you have it recorded is a lot of things. They could pause the YouTube video. They could count fish. They could measure fish. They could take a closer look at some of the fish and really get up close and personal with them, which you can't do while they're swimming around in a tank. Um, they could go back in time. They could say, how much have these salmon grown in the last month? Well, let's go look back at February's video and see, and they could make that comparison. So we also had students from all over participating. I had students from all grades, all ages, uh, parents as well, really getting excited about watching salmon grow. So our audience grew as well. And then it's definitely less work for the teachers. So I'm hoping our teachers don't say I only want to do virtual because of the work, but yes, they didn't have to clean tanks, change water, worry about keeping fish alive for five months out of the year, which is a big, big, big job. So I hope moving forward side by side, we'll do virtual and in-person and give those students the, the best opportunity for learning about salmon that they can have uh, moving forward. So with that, um, I am done. I, along with Chris, I'm sure we could take questions. And thank, thank you again. You. Yeah, thank you so much, Kara. Um, and Nikki, okay. if you've got some questions, awesome. We did have a one came in from Lily was asking a little bit earlier in your presentation, uh, were you able to provide clock hours for the virtual teacher trainings? Yeah, yeah. I work through the Northwest Natural Resource Institute in Spokane and Dion Gill there is, she's the executive director and they are a clock hour provider through OSPI. Um, so yes. Uh, and there were STEM clock hours as well, which you know teachers are just cool. Uh, they can't get enough uh, trainings right now with STEM clock hours. So if you're offering them, they will come. Great. We also had a hand go up. Kari, um, you are unmuted if you want to ask your question directly. Could have been an errant hand as well. Um, <laughs> If you're having trouble getting unmuted, uh, Kari, just let me know in the chat and we can work on it. Or if you didn't mean to put your hand up, you can put that down, but you are, you should be unmuted and able to chat um, if you want. Otherwise, perhaps type it in. Ah, there we go. Okay. Okay, we can hear you. Multiple clicks. Thanks, Nicole. Um, Kara, I'm really curious. You keep talking about educators and so I'm, how big is your staff? Because I to fall back on what Lily was saying, we're trying to find um, more unique ways to reach students and to meet our deliverables for contracts. And wow, oh wow, if the teacher workshops could play a role, but then how many educators do you have? So at the conservation district, pre-COVID, I had 11 full-time educators and then there were four educators that worked for other conservation districts that did part-time wee week um, or drain rangers. So Jody at Palouse, Stacy at Spokane CD, Elliot at uh, Grant uh, CD, and Kirk at Cascadia. They all implemented my programs in their area, but they were not my employees. So the other 11 were mine. Um, when COVID hit, several of them uh, decided to part ways and do their own thing. Uh, so five of them stayed with me. I'm down to four right now because one has already left. So during COVID, we only I only had the five educators around the state uh, delivering kits and helping my program uh, maintain for the year. We are going to ramp back up because my funding uh, was has still been strong through the Grain Commission, 
And so we'll go back up to, I'm hoping those 11 educators around the state plus the four at the other, at the CDs. So 15, hopefully we'll ramp back up to 15. So does that help? Yeah, she said, wow, and thank you <laughs> for your answer. Okay, Nikki, I don't know if you have questions, just remind folks, questions for either of the presenter, um, if you want to put those into the questions box or raise your hand, uh, we can easily ask a question as you just saw. I did have a question. Um, did you, do you have any tips for keeping young students engaged? I love the idea of the short videos. Any other like best practices or takeaways? So we also created a worksheet that went with the videos. So that was in the kit, it was part of the hands-on. So at least we could kind of break up. So in this video, you're gonna be answering these questions. So it would kind of keep the students engaged. It was also an assessment for the teachers. The teachers could put that on, um, they, the kids could answer them with Screencastify or whatever they were using to show their teacher that they had answered those questions. Um, just that was really the takeaway. Next year, I'm hoping, because we're going to keep virtual Wheat Week, so what I want to do is, um, honestly, Miss Megan did a great job doing our videos, and she literally shot them with her iPhone, which iPhones these days are pretty good quality, right? But I have a friend, Kara Rowe at North by Northwest, who I'm hoping we can get some professional-made videos that will last for a very long time. And uh, so... So I'm planning on, on kind of having like it professionally done, so they're really nice, but um, incorporating some animation in with it, some of our little videos that we would share normally during Wee Week, but also maybe some new am animation, just to keep kids engaged and keep them up and going. Uh, one of my other educators also suggested we do some songs because that's a large GLAD strategy. If you're not familiar with GLAD, GLAD stands for Guided Language Acquisition Design. It's for second language learners to help them um, understand new academic uh, language. And so songs are a good way to do that. So maybe incorporating some more songs. Uh, we've been throwing around those ideas. That sound great. Yeah. Um, I was also gonna ask, where can we see these videos? Are they publicly available <laughs> on YouTube? We don't necessarily have them out there in public. We've just been sharing them because we've been sharing them with the teachers once they get their kits, kind of letting teachers understand that you need to order through us to get this information. That was the way we tracked how many teachers, you know, were utilizing our program. But I can, I wonder if I can put the link in the chat. You know, I have a different computer right now, so I don't have it um, linked. But Megan, if you are on, one of my educators, Megan, she is the star of the videos. She is on, I think, this uh, webinar, and maybe she could put it in the questions box, and you, and you could share it then, the link to our YouTube videos. You bet. Megan, if you don't mind. Great. Thanks so much, Kara. Yeah. Oh, and let me give a shout out for um, some more professional development. If you're not familiar with the ESDs, um, they offer a lot of professional development and for free and virtual. Um, so if you go to any of the ESDs, there's nine of them on, around the state and you go to what they call their PD enroller, it'll be a list of all of the offerings around the state. And because they're virtual, you can really sign up for any of the ESDs offerings because you know they're not confined to area. And there's um, some trainings being put on by the Association of ESDs that are for inclusionary practices and there's 10 different modules maybe 11 different modules that me and my educators have just gone through and some of them are really valuable just um, lots of good resources lots of good information um, again that's through the aesd and it's called inclusionary practices um it's ipp anyways it, it's really you know the the topics and trending things that are going on in education right now, the social emotional learning pieces and just a lot of good stuff. Big shout out for them. Wonderful, thanks for sharing that great resource. Did we have any additional questions in the chat, Nicole, for any of the presenters? Not at this time, no. And just a note that Megan did send me over that link and I put it in the chat, so that should be accessible by everyone now. That's awesome. And just so you know, Megan's famous now. She gets seen all over the place and, and people are like, are you the one in the videos? And <laughs> so, 
Thank you again to Megan Stewart. She has been with me for 11 years teaching Wheat Week. So yeah, she's she's my right hand. Great, well, thank you so much, Kara and yeah. Chris and Leica. We appreciate learning about how you adapted some of your educational programming. And we look forward to hearing how you guys plan for the next school year. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Thank you.